Bhutti. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our poetry night. Um, to thank you for being here. Um, I'm Anjana, and I'm doing my trainship here. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our director's guest, Mark Doty. He is the author of several poetry collections, most recently, Deep Lane, A Swarm, A Flock, A Host, A Compendium of Creatures, and Fire to Fire, New and Selected Poems, recipients of the National Book Award. Other collections include Atlantis, recipient, recipient of the Ambassador Book Award, the Bingham Poetry Prize, and, Lam and, a, and the Lambda Literary Award. Maya Alexandria, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award and the T.S. Eliot Prize, and was a National Book Award finalist. His memoirs include Heaven's Coast, recipient of the Pan Martha Alburn Award, as well as Still Life with Oysters and Lemon, An Object and Intimacy and, and Dog Years. Toby has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Wyden Foundation. Please welcome Mark Doty. I am uh, going to read four poems. Uh, they are, two of them were seriously revised here. Uh, two are brand new. And the, the first one uh, I'm beginning with because we happen to have a four-legged member of the audience and the poem specifically addresses what it's like to have four paws, as I imagine it. I live in New York City uh, in a third floor walk up with an elderly golden retriever. His name is Ned. This is called The Stairs. Nearly 12, Ned lifts one broad paw onto the next step up, and when it slides a bit to the right, pulls it in towards his body and pushes from below. Then the left paw follows, and he has hauled his bulk up one step. Three flights. Remarkable, really. How he huffs and focuses and steams up the first flight, then negotiates a shorter step before he confronts the longer, curving stair that spills him out into the hall for our door. There, I praise his determination, his stamina and pluck, hard enough for him to stand up from the warm spot on the rug where he sleeps the day away, head parked on the cool marble threshold of the bathroom door. He makes just one demand. These morning and evening salvos up the stairs. If I walk too quickly and pause a few risers above him, he goes no further. He waits until I climb back down to him. He's made it clear. We go side by side or he will not go at all. In this way, he proposes, we will enter into the future. Sometimes I stall at a cold plunge beneath my shoes, as if the next step gave way to a wrong end of the telescope view of time ahead without him. Then he puts one thick blonde paw on the tread immediately above us and waits for me to do the same. So, um, a while back, I drafted a poem thought I had written a poem, finished it, uh, which involves uh, sky lanterns or, or fire balloons, you know, the, those sack, paper sacks you light a wick underneath, the thing fills up with heat, and it takes off. Oh, this is what they should call them frail, illegal fire balloons. Um, and I woke up a, a few nights ago at about one in the morning and thought about this poem and realized how much I'd lied in it. And I started to go. So there it goes. It doesn't have a title yet. It's, a, it, it, it's an attempt to account for a big mistake. Yeah. It, it, so it, it might be called account, but I can't tell you. Six sky lanterns, dangerous invitations, packed flat, rice paper sack glued to the seams, thin bamboo ring at bottom for a mouth, wire armature holding a deck of cards, side stack of paper soaked in wax. My birthday present. Frail, illegal, Bishop Paul the ones that wrecked in treetops. But who could resist a lamp lifted by its own heat, sailing out over a black bay on an August night at Land's End? Deep, unfractioned evening bent down toward a horizon, lost in the dark. I huddled around our flashlight's cone with a man I misjudged so spectacularly I'd spend years trying to account for my mistake. 
in our fortunate circle, a blonde grass as a dune, a bit of asphalt, and just in case, a fire extinguisher. Unfold the paper shell, steady the base, touch the lighter to the wick. In our four hands, the thing swells, tugs, and suddenly it's a bucking saffron lung we can't hold back a moment longer. A flammable excitation already out of our hands. Lit from within, go see its arcs from side to side, hurrying up and out over the waters of a night big enough to erase it. If only, if only, I could have let him go too, and not lit the rest, five more flares tearing upward into animal winking fire, writing in air the shape they would make, this and no other. Reader, I set no one's house afire but my own. Don't ask. We made the night enormous for a little while, and then nearly dark. Drunk on birthday wine, and maybe having smoked a little too, he miscounted, and brought no lantern for the decade that began that night. So we drove home to begin the years it took me to be done with him. <laughs> Does that explain it? Oh. <laughs> Divorce and process, no. Long process. So these two poems uh, began here and are somewhere in the direction of complete. That, that means, you know, should you ever see these again, they may be different, who knows. Uh, this is called Madonna del Parto. And, and many of us are thinking about Piero's Madonna after a trip the other day. Madonna del Parto. God stands poised, her superb tent lined in ermine, her angels clearly nothing but her own thoughts, bare but not quite incarnate, only a single wing each to sketch them into place, holding up two red silk flaps, lavish, embroidered, to show us how they'll soon sequester her in this royal chamber of fur. Would she like me calling her God? A humble virgin, tradition says, but Piero isn't having it. He's given her an expression so complexly indeterminate modernity rushes into it. She's proud, haughty, melancholy, rueful, her back aches. She sees her child's torture and death at the hands of empire, but cannot see his resurrection. Because there isn't one? Of course there is. And in a town nearby as well, stunning fresco in which her son with an athlete's lean body and startled, once dead face strides up and out of the tomb. She will never move. Would she mind me calling her God when she's poised here on a timeless brink of birthing? The word will be made flesh, the world will be ruined, but not yet. She is poised here forever at about two. Thank you. And this last, uh, you know, sometimes experience just sort of conspires to hand you a poem. And this last is a simple little poem about finding something in the garden here, called Late Season. Late August sun has fired the garden so superbly on this unreal hillside that the dry artichoke I picked days ago seems an armored ruin, dragon claw on a stone stem, stiff petals twisted as though I plucked it from the flames. I set it in my room, on the nightstand, forgot it, and I don't know how it happened. Here it is. Lavender beard scented with honey, net resting on the yellow shadow of its own pollen. I don't know. I think the will to bloom doesn't end. 